Hey, Tim, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having me, Kevin. So obviously, I've, I've followed your journey a bit on Twitter. Uh, very interested in your story. Uh, I'd love to hear your backstory uh, of Pally. Um, first of all, maybe tell listeners what Pally does and what led you to founding the company originally. Yeah. Um, so Pally is a social media management platform. Um, you're familiar with those. Uh, well, so yeah. <laughs> I built it for brands and social media agencies specifically. Um, and the way that I came across Pally was I taught myself to code and essentially was just trying to come up with ideas of things to build um, and started Pally. But Pally didn't start off as a social media management platform. It started as a Instagram analytics platform. So I was just sort of focusing on that at the start and later down the track, we rebranded and changed to Pally and added the scheduling and all the other features that we have today. So I'm curious, so you mentioned you weren't actually coding before Pally. So what were you doing in a previous life? Yeah, so I was working in a trade. I was a locksmith for 10 years. And I also worked with a friend at a marketing agency for a while. So yeah, I was doing those things. And another thing that I did was I had a, I paid to get an app built. Um, this was probably a couple of years before Pally, but it gave me a bit of an introduction into the digital space. And I paid somebody to make an Instagram video editing app. And sort of through that, I realized that it's quite expensive to do. And if I wanted to build um, a business online, I really needed to teach myself how to code. So that's sort of what led me to it. That's brilliant. Yeah, I, I've, been, I've been speaking to a lot of founders looking for advice. Um, and they aren't always technical. Um, so they always say to me, like, you know, I want to outsource development to a company mm -hmm. in, in Ukraine or wherever it is. And I always advise them to try to get a, either a CTO, a technical co-founder, or learn yeah. to code themselves. So I think what you've done is, is amazing. Exactly. I think if you have to outsource it and pay somebody to build your app, you're going to be going back and forth constantly. It's going to cost you money each time you want to add a new feature. And I just, unless you've got a lot of money, that seems pretty, pretty tricky. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so a Pally is spelled P A L L Y Y dot com. Could you explain maybe the name, like kind of where the name came from um, and how you came up with that? Yeah. Um, so basically, when I started Pally, it was called something called Share My Insights. And because when I started the Instagram analytics platform, the way that I was trying to stand out was by making your Instagram analytics shareable so you could share your insights with other people. Um, but as we grew and added scheduling and all of these other features, share my insights just didn't really make sense. So we needed to do a bit of a bit of a rebrand. And Pally was just a thing that I came up with. I wanted Pally with just one Y, but the dot com was taken. So they wanted, I think, twenty thousand for it or something like that. So I just ended up going with two Ys. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned before, obviously both of us are, well, were in the social, I was, I was in the social media space. Um, but with, with so many tools in the market, you know, you've got Hootsuite, Spar Social, Sendable, all the others, Agora Pulse. What would you say makes Pally different and how have you been able to attract customers in such a crowded sort of market? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it is really hard to make yourself stand out when there's so many platforms out there these days. So Pally, I've focused on making it really easy to use. So that's been like my number one thing that I've focused on throughout the whole journey, just making it really easy to use. And also just keeping it affordable. So we just have one plan, it's $15 per month, and it just sort of scales as you grow, like that's for one social set. Um, so it's just really, it's just affordable and you know everybody can, it's easy to use, yeah. Yeah, I think with the market right now, I think you've kind of timed it well to have a price point that's so low. And the people are yeah, very price right. sensitive now with the recession or whatever is happening in the economy. So I think I think exactly. it's a very, very smart move to keep the pricing simple. So it's $15 a month, and then you can add more 15, bundles of yeah. social profiles. Is that right? Exactly, yeah. So it's like one social set includes a profile from each, each platform, and that's $15. And then if you're an agency, you just times that by how many clients you have. Oh, brilliant. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I had a call the other day with somebody who was using one of the bigger players, Hootsuite, and they actually were increasing the price by 
I think it was about 500%. I saw that on was, Twitter, actually, yeah. Okay, yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm getting a fair few customers because of because of that. Yeah. I think we, I think from, from my experience at Tendable, we saw uh, kind of a migration towards Facebook Creator Studio as well. So I think that's when I realized we had to go down market, um, mm -hmm. drop our pricing even more to compete with Facebook directly. Are you finding something right. similar for you guys that people are moving to the free tools or? Um, not particularly. I think maybe it happens with some of our smaller customers, but when it's agencies, I think mm -hmm. they just need to be able to schedule and manage all their socials, not just Facebook. They want to do it all in the one space. So I don't get many people leaving for um, Facebook, no. That's brilliant. Um, are you able to give listeners just an idea of the scale of where you're at now? Maybe not, not in terms of revenue if you're uncomfortable, but just in terms of uh, yeah. kind of uh, from, from when you guys launched to mm -hmm. now, like number of customers or anything you can share that gives, it, gives listeners a sense of how big you guys have become? Yeah. Um, yeah, I won't share my MRR or anything like that, but uh, at the moment we have about 800 paying customers um, and it's just grown to that in the last year, basically. I've been running Pally for three years and we have tens of thousands of people on our free plan as well. So is the free plan just like a limited, like is it limited functionality or what's, what's yeah, in there? Yeah, it's, the free plan is just 15 posts per month and some features are limited like a carousel post i think you have to upgrade to do that mm -hmm. but most of the features are all in there so you can still try it out still see everything that it does and and yeah so that's that's what's in the free plan and your team is it just you right now or do you have anyone helping you with any of the other sort of it's just me it's just been <laughs> me the whole time i mean yeah. i have somebody that helps me with doing like social media posts and uh, writing blog posts and things like that, but it's just me doing the customer service, the marketing, the coding, everything. Yeah. So obviously we, we have quite a few founders who are kind of solo founders. Uh, yeah. So I'm keen to, could you describe your average day? Like how would you describe what your day looks like in terms of managing all that stuff and juggling sure. everything? Yeah. Um, well, usually I will try to get the customer service done first. I like to get that out of the way. It usually takes me 30 minutes to an hour every morning. So I'll get started with that. Um, once that's done, I'll move into any fixing any bugs or anything, any bugs that somebody's reported overnight, something like that. Um, and then I'll work on new features throughout the day and just other little bits and pieces. But mm. that's basically the structure of my day. Yeah. And are you able to work eight hours a day or are you kind of stretching that a bit? Like what's your work life balance uh, like? Yeah, I work pretty much seven days a week um, for the whole three years that I've been working on Pally. But, and I probably work about eight hours a day as well, except on the weekends, I, I don't. But I do split my day up and go to the gym in the middle of the day just to sort of break it up a bit. Yeah. And what would you say has been your biggest challenge since launching Pally? The biggest challenge? Um, so the biggest challenge would probably just be finding customers essentially mm -hmm. yeah that's that's just the number one thing that's that was hard in the start um i learned a program but i've never been much of a marketer so yeah like actually promoting pally and focusing on marketing took me far too long yeah yeah no, it's so the same it's thing i've seen yeah i mean obviously with, with sendable back then it was so much easier to market i just wrote to TechCrunch and a few other publications and they wrote about us and that drove like thousands of users. Oh, that's amazing. But now with, with Story Prom, with the new company, it's a, it's a whole yeah. different ball game now. I have to kind of really focus on marketing to get people in, get the eyeballs yeah. and attention and everything. So yeah, I agree. Exactly. I think I think marketing is probably the, the most important thing you can do as a founder, like learning how to market. Um, and what what portion do you think you spend marketing and building Story Prompt? Yeah, so the way I so I'm, I'm keeping Story Prompt very small as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Send about 50 plus employees. This is the yeah. opposite. It's like two of us. Um, so yeah, I, I try like work almost in sprints in my own kind of sprints, but I'll build a feature for maybe two weeks and then do two weeks of marketing and then two weeks of building, two weeks of marketing. Yeah. It's the only way I can do it. Okay. Otherwise yeah. I get taught in too many directions. So I yeah. kind of do that, but I try to think of like initiatives that can drive eyeballs. So rather than just mm -hmm. like announcing the feature, I try to find more creative ways like building a community or getting people on my newsletter. That means mm -hmm. that I can just like kind of reduce the level of friction. 
to get yep. people to hear my message. So those kinds of things are happening while I'm doing that that building phase, but then having a two week sprint just to get the message out again, and then maybe doing a product hunt launch in that period. Yeah. So it varies, yeah. but it's, it's generally like having time boxed activities okay. rather than like yeah. jumping between things. That's how I find works for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably the best way to do it really. Just split it completely like that 50, 50. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really do it like that, but I'm sort of a little bit all over the place, but I probably should. Keeps it interesting doing though. <laughs> one week, yeah, it keeps it yeah. interesting. But I should be doing more marketing than I probably am. But I'm trying. So, so you you managed to grow Pally by ten x from years two to three. Um, <clears throat> I know our listeners would be very keen to hear how you kind of did that. Could you maybe share like the top three things that helped to fuel your growth in that period? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, the main thing that I think sort of started the growth was basically just the fact that I started marketing. It took me almost two years to realize that I really needed to start focusing on marketing. I know that's quite a long time and people might give up before then, but I started marketing, yeah, towards the end of year two in Pali. And I basically just started reaching out to people on Instagram. I started messaging social media agencies, social media managers, just trying to get anybody to use a platform that had more than one client because I sort of, I changed who I was targeting. I just wanted to target social media agencies. And that was great. I started, I started getting a few people. I didn't get much response, as you could imagine, just randomly sending messages to people on Instagram. You're not going to get a great response all the time. But I did get some customers that are, uh, still Pally customers today and they've obviously spread the word and helped grow the business with me as of as I've gone along um, so that was the main thing um, but also at the same time I had actually changed my pricing structure for Pally so when we started Pally was had a it had a 14 day free trial but you had to put your credit card in to start it so you couldn't you couldn't try anything which was a massive roadblock mm. and once i removed that and added the free plan i think it just allowed people to just get in and try it out and didn't give them that pressure of just having to put their credit card up front for something that they don't know anything about and they don't trust mm. um so yeah that's that's probably the main two things i guess that sort of helped kickstart our growth yeah yeah, on that point about credit cards, the same thing I did at Sendable a couple of years, only a couple of years ago, actually. We changed mm -hmm. our sign-up flow to remove that credit card form. It also drove yeah. so many more trialists into the platform. Um, just on the, on the point you, meant, you mentioned about DMs, can you give an example mm -hmm. just of maybe a template for listeners that they could use that they work for you? Um, yeah. Just Even just a rough idea of how you kind of structure that message mm -hmm. in, in the DMs. It changed a lot over the days when i started doing it at the start i'd write a big wall of text trying to explain to them why they should use pally but what worked best was just asking them a question would you be interested in trying out pally it's a social media management platform and that's basically it i just wanted to keep it really short and succinct i guess yeah. because if you see a big message coming through you're just going to ignore it yeah. you're not going to do anything so I just tried to keep it really simple and you know my res my response rate was pretty low um but the people that did respond were keen and it was great yeah it worked well and you focused mainly on instagram right so i assume you were searching for agencies agency owners that kind of thing yeah, and then, yeah. at the start you know we started as an instagram analytics platform then i and added scheduling for instagram so it was heavily instagram focused at the start now we've sort of pivoted we include all social platforms but yeah it was just instagram so reaching out to people on instagram was the perfect place for me to do that and mm -hmm. a lot of social media managers and agencies are on instagram and they're active so it was it was yeah. a perfect place and like now obviously a few years in like how do you attract new customers now these days it's more seo based so that's one of the other things that i started doing last year was just focusing on you know stepping up our seo 
writing blog posts. I hired somebody to write blog posts for me because I started doing that, but that didn't last long. I couldn't keep that up while yeah. trying to do customer support and building the platform. It's just too hard. Yeah. So I would just try and get a blog post out every single day um, and also focus on work, like just making the website faster, just trying to rank for different keywords. Mm. And that's probably the number one way we get new customers today. That's amazing. So they, they're kind of searching for something um, linked to social media and they find your content yeah. or are you doing external link building as well? I'm not doing any link building. At the very start of Pally, I did a little bit of link building, trying to, you know, get links in return from other links and all that. But it just, it's that's that's hard. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that's that's a hard game. So you just kind of got to create good content, like try and focus on creating good content and not focusing on the keywords too much. Like you do want to have some kind of idea of the keywords you want to target, but trying to create content that people will actually read and find useful. Yeah. 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 I mean, what worked for me in terms of SEO was kind of um, reaching out to affiliates, people who've mm -hmm. written listicles, you know, like top yes. 10 social media tools yep. and getting them to put sendable on top. Have you done that kind of thing as well? Like where you offer them a, an affiliate link in exchange for the yeah. you app the list? Yeah. We, uh, I've added an affiliate program as well. And that's probably my number two uh, channel of getting new customers these days as well. So it's exactly that as you, as you wrote people yeah. doing top 10 social media scheduling platforms and adding us in there. Mm. So that drives quite a few new users, yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're a solo bootstrapped founder. Um, I know what, it, what it's like, and it's quite a lonely journey. Did you ever consider looking for a co-founder or raising funding? Um, and what would it take for you to change your perspective on that? Hmm, yeah, interesting. Um, I have never really considered raising funding. I think that being a small company for me in a field of, you know, where there's so many big players and big companies like, you know, Hootsuite, Sendable, Sprout Social, I think being a small company is one of the things that sets us apart and being able to add new features really quickly, talk directly with customers and that's sort of what makes us stand out a little bit. So I've never really considered raising funding. Yeah. And with a co-founder, you know, I, I would like it. You know, it would be great if I could have found somebody who was really good at marketing. I've heard all the stories, you know, it's one person who programs and one person who markets and they just work really well together. But mm. I don't didn't know how to find somebody like that, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think your point about being small as an advantage is is really true. Uh, you know, like even last night we had this agency uh, from Brisbane in Australia that we we demoed, um, and we showed him how we can iterate very quickly on the product based on his feedback, and he mm -hmm. basically signed up as a paying customer overnight. Uh, just I think I think mainly because we're smaller and we're more accessible than some of the bigger yeah. tools in our space. So I definitely think being smaller, more approachable, more human is a huge advantage. Uh, and people, and, yeah. And people like the fact that you can, you're more willing to add a feature that they're requesting right there. And it That's might it. be live in a week or two weeks or at the end of the day. Whereas yeah. if you're, you know, joining one of the bigger companies, it just, you you don't get that kind of service. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me at Sendable, like that was the biggest point of frustration. Like we had, we had a massive development team. I think we were in the twenties, over 20 people. Wow. And That's if a feature came great. in, a feature request came in, it took us probably almost, almost up to a year to get the feature out. Wow. Because of all the process, the roadmap, the backlog, uh, we just couldn't That's jump on things crazy. that quickly. You yeah. know, we had a QA team who were testing things, product mm. team who were writing all the specs <laughs> and requirements. <laughs> so that, I think process yeah. often slows you down. Um, but I could see why. You know, we got to a point of scale where we needed that process. But when you're small, you can just take chances and take risks and just get things out. Um, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going through levels of testing and all that kind of stuff. I just... <laughs> Building the feature and putting it out there as fast as possible. <laughs> Hoping for the best. Usually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, so one of the things I've heard you say is that it's not always about listening to your customers, but more knowing your customer. Can you elaborate on what you mean by this um, and what led to this epiphany while building P Pally? Yeah, so basically 
obviously you have to listen to your customer. That's like the number one thing to do when building a business. You know, that's what made us change from Instagram analytics to scheduling and where we are now. But I think, and it helps being a small business, um, being able to listen to your customer, but also really understand what they need and know what they sort of, what they want can really help. So even in terms of features, I would add features that nobody had requested, but they ended up getting me some of the biggest clients that I have today. But it's, and it's only because I knew that that's probably what the, they needed just mm. from talking to them, from looking at tickets in our roadmap and building features, you just get a better idea, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I think once you're in the space for a while, you kind of get a hunch of what people actually want. Yeah. Um, yeah I had that at Santa Blur as well, like from doing it for 13 years, you kind of know what the market needs. Um, but then we, we had this product team with a UX researcher, product researcher, who would then take my idea and then go research it as well to make sure I was right. So that those okay. kinds of things, again, that's, 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 like, that's handy to have. Yeah. <laughs> it's handy to have just yeah. to like kind of check that that's the right thing before you start investing in product. Yeah. Um, so I think that's what you get to when you get to scale. But when you're smaller, yeah. you have to just follow your hunch, go through gut feel, this exactly. customers, as you said, and then you kind of have this, uh, this picture of what they need before they even realize they need it, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, sometimes I will send an, an, maybe one or two emails to some of my bigger clients and then just ask them, you know, do you think this could be something that you might like maybe in the future? That's yeah. about as far as my um, validation <laughs> goes. <laughs> but it doesn't work every time. You know, yeah. sometimes you build a feature and nobody uses it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, obviously there are a lot of there are a lot of founders out there that I speak to that are always looking for like brand new, fresh, unique ideas. Uh, you know, Gavin, do you think it's a good idea? And I always say you have to go execute to figure out if it's a good idea. But you've obviously taken something that exists already, a social media scheduling management tool. That's a, it's a current idea. It doesn't, it's, not, it's not anything new. What's your perspective on having to have a fresh idea versus iterating on what already exists in the market? Well, I think coming up with a fresh idea it's quite hard you know you need to come across a if it's a unique idea you've kind of got to come across it naturally i guess it's got to be a gap in the market or a feature that's missing from something that you come across and say hey this is a really good opportunity for a tool um trying to just force it and come up with your own unique ideas quite hard and it's what i did when i started pally but if i had to start over, I would probably just find an established market like a social media management and just try to join and just create mm -hmm. a really good product instead of trying to come up with this unique idea that you've got to then try and validate and see if people even want it. Um, when I started Pally, my feature that was going to make me stand out was the fact that you could get your Instagram analytics and then share them with other people. I thought that that was really unique and cool, but nobody used that, nobody. So I learned really fast, like I had to move, I mm -hmm. had to pivot and I started just working on Instagram analytics and yeah. Yeah, so, I think it's very true if you're bootstrapping as well, like you, you really can't afford to try shift the market or shift the behavior of the market in a way that mm -hmm. suits your idea. So you have yeah. to, yeah, you're right. You have to build in a market that exists already, try to find a little niche or a space and then attract yeah. those people. So yeah, yeah. It makes, and then, it makes you, sense. then you can add your little features that make you unique as well along the way, once you yeah. get to know what people want and things like that. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned obviously the DMs as something that you've done that's, that's pretty unscalable, I would say. Uh, what else have you done that hasn't necessarily been scalable, something that you couldn't necessarily repeat um, for a long term, for, long, for a long period, um, that's helped yeah. your business grow in, in big ways? some other unscalable methods yeah i when i first started pally i would get a lot of people cancel because i didn't have the features that they needed but what i would do is try to i would reach out to every single person that canceled i'd try to I'd, sometimes i'd reach out to them multiple times just to try to get some feedback if it's good or bad um and i would get barely anything but i did get some little things that would help me sort of grow along the way um and other things i also went through a stage of sending emails to social media agencies so i guess it's kind of along 
the same path as sending DMs on Instagram, but just using email, um, trying to attract people that way. And that didn't work very well at all. I wonder why. Do you think people just don't use email as much or they get so many out there? I mean, they just ignore yeah. that. What do you do when you see, you know, <laughs> a spammy looking email come through into your inbox? It's just, okay, let's move yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that didn't work well. But I think just talk, trying to talk to people who canceled was a good, good method. Yeah. And what's your long term goal for Pally? Are you, do you want to exit one day or are you trying to build a long term sustainable business? What's the, the goal there? I don't really have an end vision at the moment. I think that I probably should. And maybe exiting one day would make sense, but it's not something that I have been actively thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, I know people say that you should build to sell, but I haven't been doing that at all. So I think I'd just like to try to grow Pally as much as possible, but at the same time, keep it as small as possible, which is mm -hmm. probably easier said than done, but that's what I'd like to do. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so before we go, uh, as I mentioned before, we have a mix of entrepreneurs, founders, marketers listening. Uh, where's the best place for them to reach out to you if they have any questions or want to learn more about Pally? Yeah, so you can find Pally on Pally.com with two Ys, or you can reach out to me on Twitter. And my Twitter handle is TimB03. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tim. Great to meet you. Thanks for having me, Gavin. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> cheers.